All right. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunk or drunkards. The master of the servant will come on the day when he does not expect him at an hour which he is not aware of. And he will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Good luck, my friend. Me hey, every time. <laughs> Good morning, church. Um, I want to I want to start this off with a uh, a story today to kind of give a another perspective on the passage that we just read. Uh, this is for anyone who is a parent. Um, who wants to be a parent, for instance, uh, who has a parent, who has seen a parent, or who knows what a parent is. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, so let's say for the sake of the story, you are a parent of this teenage kid. You know, let's call him Schmalton. <laughs> and you and your spouse are going out of town to see the Canes game, right? They're playing Florida, and it's what was it? Game seven. It's game seven. You're going and you leave the house to your son, Schmalton. And he promises that the house will not be on fire and he will not do dumb things while you are gone. And so you and your spouse get packed up and leave and you're pretty far into the drive. And then you realize somehow, some way, you forgot the phone that has the tickets on him. You're not going to get into the game without him. You totally forgot to send a picture of them to the other phone that you have. And so you have to go all the way back and miss probably the first two periods, which, dang, I would hate that. Now, you get to the house, right? You drove all the way back. And there are all these cars parked around in the cul-de-sac. It's like this movie scene. You open the door. Slowly, and all of this loud music erupts from the living room, and you see all of these people dancing around and partying, and in the center of all of it is Schmalton. <laughs> um, my mother tells me not to do this all the time, and so this was a great example I had to pull. Um, but as soon as you get all these partiers out of your house, which takes a while, you finally question your son. And the first thing out of his mouth is, I thought you were coming back later. <laughs> right? How are you going to feel after hearing that? If this was a real scenario, not like I'm, not like I'm talking to you and you're laughing at it. <laughs> but after hearing any, really any excuse, like you probably feel angry and disappointed with your son, right? But I thought you were coming back later, to me, feels like a betrayal, like a betrayal of trust. Um, I'm going to read this one more time, um, just so we can kind of think about that as we um, read it once more. Verse 45, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this whole passage, Jesus is drawing up an illustration for his followers. 
comparing two different servants to their master and comparing us to these two different servants. One is called faithful, and the other is called evil. There are two sides to this coin. Now, both of them are given the same task, to oversee and to care for their fellow servants. Now, the faithful one goes and he does what the master asks. He cares for the servants and is rewarded for doing so when the master comes back. And as he was put in charge of the servants in the household, which is, you know, kind of like being put as the older sibling and you have all the power, <laughs> you make the decisions. Well, now he's given charge of all the possessions. Now he's put in charge of the house. The faithful servant is, uh, what Jesus is doing, is he's representing what a follower of Christ looks like. The follower just does just what the master commands, despite the fact that he is gone and delayed in his coming back. Now he goes and he cares for the other servants, making sure he feeds them at the proper time, following his word to the letter. And he continues to do that until the master comes back and he sees him being faithful. And then he's rewarded with more to take charge over. Now, the master doesn't say when he's going to come back. And Jesus mentions this in the next couple of verses. But the servants don't know when their master will be back to see what they've done. And so the situation becomes, for both of them, what are you going to do and who are you going to be when the master isn't home and when no one's looking? This is a question we ought to ask ourselves based on what we read in this passage because this is an illustration, a parable for us. Which servant do we most resemble with our actions behind the scenes? If God dropped in on us, what would we be doing? Who would we be? And I, these questions really put ourselves under the microscope so we can see we don't measure up. And God, God knows all the things that we do, all the things that we do in the dark. He sees all of them, and he knows all of them. And so, as Christians, we thank God for his grace uh, through Jesus' death on the cross and then resurrection on the third day, that we are saved by faith so that we might not have to endure the fate of the evil servant. This grace is a uniting foundation for Christians. But I want to come back to something Derek said a few weeks ago. He said, um, God meets us where we are, but he doesn't let us stay there. God wants us to be that faithful servant, and then he's given us grace to do so. So, if we want to avoid, you know, what happens to the evil servant... How could we be like the faithful one? That's the question. We're going to look at what both of them and us have been given. And I think the most umbrella term for this is influence, for what we're going to talk about. We are all influencers, guys. We're influencers. <laughs> like the folks on social media. I'll use them as an example. Very literal. It is their job to get people to do things, to influence people. Maybe it's to buy a product Maybe it's to sell a lifestyle, or maybe most of the time it's just to watch more of their videos. But now, not all of us are influencers, I suspect, but in a more literal sense, we all have the ability to influence things and the people around us and the things around us. And I think that's a gift that God has given us. We all have the ability to influence, say, what goes on in our workplace. Ooh. We all have the ability to use our influence and connections to find jobs that we want to have. We can use our influence to change laws if we want to. But the most important influence that God gives us is influence on other people. And all the time we use that influence to impact other people's lives, for better and for worse. Now God has uh, given us the influence to impact the lives of people around us and to do that for his glory. But how do we do that? The simple answer is we need to be like Jesus. But that's a very difficult thing to just jump right into. Um, it comes with a lot of trust in what God has to offer, and it's nearly, nearly impossible to just become like Jesus immediately. So what can we do to get to that point where we start to really resemble Christ? And it starts with what we do when no one's around. It starts with the heart. And if there is a heart changed... If there is a heart for what God wants us to do and what God wants us to be, who God wants us to be, then the things that we start to do faithfully in the dark will start to bear fruit in the light. When we become someone who truly wants to follow God, our hearts will change. 
Soon that will start to impact our life and have us yearning to know and follow all of God's commands and to be faithful. And when we do that, we start to go and impact other lives. And we impact the kingdom. And God, like he does with the faithful servant, when we do that, we use our influence faithfully. He gives us more influence. When we are faithful, he gives us more to be faithful with. And now this particular passage isn't really an instruction manual on how to be faithful with a whole lot of stuff, but that can be found elsewhere. But it's a promise of what's to happen if we use our influence faithfully or if we use it unfaithfully and selfishly. Now to look at this evil servant a little bit more. Seems like the underlying factor of this evil servant's decision-making is a problem of selfishness. He finds out that his master is going to be gone for quite a while. He doesn't know when his master is going to come back, and so he immediately starts doing things that bring him pleasure and stuff that the master obviously would not want him to have done. But he's going to do it anyways, kind of like the teenager I talked about at the beginning, Schmalton. And so he goes and uses his authority over the other servants to beat them and then goes out of his way to live the high life with others that do the same. And likely at the back of his mind, he knows that his master is going to come back. But he probably thinks, you know, he'll send word or something of the sort and give the servant enough time to clean up the mess he's made and pretend like nothing ever happened. Going back to the teenager story right where we left off. You know, I thought you were coming back later. If you're standing in the middle of this mess, you're probably thinking that your kid betrayed you. He betrayed your trust, and he has to pay for that betrayal. And so you hand out the punishment, and it is much worse than the kid even thought he was going to get. Back to the evil servant. Because he believes that he has plenty of time to square his relationship with his master, his conduct immediately becomes evil. He betrays his master's trust because he wants so badly to do his own thing. And the crazy thing is, the faithful one might have wanted to do his own thing as well. But he didn't. And why is that? The difference between the faithful and evil servant is the love that they had for God. Jesus talks about money in his Sermon on the Mount. And that one cannot serve two masters, for he will love one and hate the other. And that concept applies here too. The faithful one did everything that the master asked him to do because he loved God and was rewarded with more to have influence over. The evil servant loved himself more than God, and so he served himself. He loved himself, so he served himself. Love the Lord your God is the greatest of all commandments, Jesus says. This is what separated the uh, faithful servant from the evil one. The faithful uses the influence and authority that the master has given him to honor his master, and then was given more influence and authority to be faithful with. The evil uses the exact same influence and authority. Maybe they both earned it the same way and used it to honor himself, losing it all and suffering for eternity. I know most of us aren't faithful servants all the time, even most of the time. And if you are, y'all ought to be up here. (laughs) What are y'all doing? And so we tend to follow this other servant's path. Now, I know we're not exactly like this servant. Times have changed. I don't know how many people, when the boss leaves, they start sucker-punching their co-workers and breaking out the champagne. (laughs) You know, maybe when the boss leaves, we might do a little bit less work, maybe pull out the phone a little bit. The ambiguity is there. And maybe we just do, you know, just enough not to get caught. But with Jesus, I feel like we've lost some sense of urgency when it comes to being faithful and not knowing when he's going to come back. And so to rephrase my question from earlier, who are we when there's no urgency in the dark? Who are we without urgency knowing that Jesus will come back at a time that we don't know, that we couldn't know? Do we think that Jesus is still coming back? And how does that relate to our conduct? We know that God gives us a certain influence, but he also gives us a whole lot more than we realize. Let's say, you know, you're out in the world, and you're looking for praise, and you're looking for applause. Likely, you will get that, and that will be your reward. That will be your reward from God, and it will be a gift to you. 
We can set our hearts and our minds on whatever we may want, and God will let us pursue that. God has a lot to offer, and he gives even when we don't believe. But he gives us the desires of our hearts, which can be good and can be very, very bad if we let it. Paul talks about this at the end of Romans 1. In verses 24, 26, and 28, he basically says, God gave the people over to their shameful lusts. To the people that truly did not want God, God let them do what they wanted because their punishment was coming later. If we trust ourselves too much to think that whatever we can accomplish is going to be what's best for us, God will let us go through with that. He will leave us to our own devices. And that, I believe, is a scary thought. Think about this. God loves everyone, even those who do not reciprocate that love, so much that he gives everyone the desires of their hearts. If I want to be, you know, incredibly focused on one thing and close minded to everything around me, and I want to live my own way and do everything the way that I want to do it, God will harden my heart for that purpose. God will give us the consequences of the desires of our hearts. Maybe it's the job we want so badly that we'll do anything and sacrifice whatever it is, to get there. All, all along the way that we've been doing that, it's been God's work. And he's been right there the entire time, giving us the heart we so desperately want, so that you know we can have the job we so desperately want. But as he's been with us the entire time, he's been offering something better, something more fulfilling than what we think will fulfill us. God knows what's best for us, but he lets us be in charge when we ask to be in charge. That's where that Jesus take the wheel thing comes from. (laughs) At the end of the day, God will give us also the consequences to to the times that we were in charge. And for too many of us, that is all the time. And we will never know God until we see the day when he is finally in charge of our lives, until he is the master that we serve, obey, and faithfully follow the instruction of. And here's the scariest bit. If we, knowingly or unknowingly, choose to have ourselves be the masters of our own lives, not only are we like the evil servant, but God will be in charge of our lives eventually. And that's at the end of our physical lives. God, out of love, gives us the chance to step back and say, not my will, Oh God, but yours. For even more examples, look at the passages surrounding what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. Just before he talks about the servants, he says that no one knows the day or hour that the Son of Man will come back. In the following parable, he speaks of uh, five virgins who use up their oil for their lamps. And when they go out to get more because they used up their supply, they miss their, their Lord coming. And when they get back, They knock on the door. They say, let us in. We're who you wanted. The Lord says, I never knew you, and I don't know you. And he doesn't let them in. In the next, after that, parable of the talents. talks about how this one man was given, you know, one, one little coin, and he hid it and did nothing with it until the master came back and was then punished for not doing anything with it, which is what the master told him to do. There's a common theme in these passages, or rather a common question that for us that Jesus poses to humanity. Who are we going to be when we stand before Christ? Jesus makes it about as black and white as it gets. We're either going to be faithful servants who share a relationship with him and who go and do his work, or we're going to miss out on being in that relationship with him. Lord, what can we do? Jesus says to lay up our treasures in heaven where nothing and no one can get to them. And that is where our reward will lie. And to do that, we have to be someone who yearns for God and God alone. If we use that influence that God has given us and we bless someone, you know, where they're at and share the gospel with them, because we love God and because we love them, our neighbors, which are the two greatest commandments, God will give us a little bit more influence that we can use to impact more people. 
But, you know, being faithful is not just about, you know, us impacting others' lives, which is a tall order. It's about what we do every day, the small things where we can be faithful. It may seem like using the influence God has given us, you know, and then to be constantly faithful with it, pretty difficult to be seen that way. But it's not, we're not going to be thrown into the public eye and seen as the perfect Christian all the time, filled with wisdom and righteousness. Our faith life and our relationship with Christ comes before all that. And it takes time to cultivate those. And it affects everything. The big stuff, like our influence. But even the small parts, like bits of our personality, our habits, our ways that we operate, the small little things show more about who we are to God than how we look in the public square. And it all goes back to who we are in the darkness without urgency. Not only are we to let God lead in our big life moments, but we're supposed to give our hearts to God even in the little things, like how we manage our anger in moments of frustration, our patience in the drive through line, our, our pride that gets in the way that I have a whole lot of struggle with. We can be faithful with those. God has given us a whole lot. We have air in our lungs, blood in our heart, time to spend and a particular influence over the earth. If we want to become like this faithful servant, we have to be faithful. We have to love God above all things and follow his commands. That's what it takes to be faithful. And the more that we learn about those commands and take steps toward accomplishing them, the more that we can be with Jesus, the more that we can become like Jesus, and then we start to see a pattern where we start doing things that Jesus did. Right over there. And so at the end of the day, what are we to do? We want to become like his faithful servant. We need to start at the heart. God can do a whole lot with a heart that's for him. And we need to give it all to him. And if that's a struggle to do, to give your heart to God, that's okay. That's something I know I've struggled with. I know people that have struggled with it. What needs to happen if you're in that spot is to look at and reordering of priorities. If God is not the top priority on our list, then something else is. And that is the master that we will serve. And once we have that heart for God that we've given up, God always asks people to pray and read the Bible, his word, to find out what God is saying and to start deepening that relationship. And with time and effort, you and the people around you will start to see the fruit that you were beginning to bear. Because if it starts at the heart, it's going to fill the darkness. Light will fill the darkness. And that will spill out into our everyday lives. We must catch ourselves when we start to prioritize other things or use our influence in the wrong ways. We have to be on alert for what God has called us to do and to stay in him. Because being with Jesus will start to make us like Jesus, which will lead us to do the things that he did. Let's pray, church. Father God, we ask that you kind of, you guide us through all of our lives and all of our decision making because we know that if we follow ourselves and we just go with the flow at the end of the day it's not going to be what's best for us you are what's best for us Lord and so we ask that you take our hearts you take the hearts that we give to you because we know that you are faithful to us. And we want to be just as faithful to you. Lord, there's a whole lot in this world that tries to distract us, that tries to pull away from us being with you. And so we ask that you, you quiet our hearts right now. Let us be with you.
We ask that you cultivate fruit within our lives. We ask that you cultivate our new hearts of flesh. We ask that you can show us exactly how we can be faithful within our lives. To follow your word to the letter. Because we know it's difficult. But because of your faithfulness, even though we fail, even though we sin, even though we get distracted, and even though we see similarities between us and the evil servant. Lord, you were faithful enough to die on the cross and to defeat the death that would await us, giving us new life. And Lord, that new life is in you. So lead us there. And in your name we pray. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is poured out for you. The symbolism represents what he did on the cross. To die the brutalest of deaths that we as humanity deserved. But he didn't end it there. He fought death and he won. And he came back three days later to show that he could not be beaten. And to show that we can be faithful to him because of his faithfulness to us. So when you're ready, 